Welcome to your Protected Places webinar, a Shared Vision for Ontario. Tonight, we're going to have an informative discussion about expanding Ontario's protected areas system. As I'm sure you know, Ontario has some of the most spectacular but threatened ecosystems and species. Uh, and protected areas are one of the key tools to stop and reverse these threats. Tonight, we're going to consider some emerging opportunities to create new protected areas and unveil a collective story map showcasing special places across the province that people would like to permanently set aside from development for future generations. My name is Tim Gray, and I'm Executive Director of Environmental Defence Canada. Environmental Defence is coordinating a collaborative program entitled Yours to Protect, which aims to bring together citizens and organizations to better protect Ontario's environment. Several of the groups participating here tonight are part of this effort, and that's why I'm here tonight to act as your MC. We've got a great um, collection of, of organizations who contributed to the presentation and discussion that you're uh, about to see, and some really interesting speakers. Um, over the next uh, about an hour and a half, we'll uh, go through a series of presentations, and uh, I think you'll find it really, really uh, informative. So let's get underway. Um, our first speaker is Elder Larry McDermott, who's an Algonquin from Shabbat Abidjan First Nation and is the Executive Director of Plenty Canada, an Indigenous NGO that does uh, fabulous work. So thanks so much for joining us, Larry, and uh, um, take it away. Please provide us with uh, an introduction. Um, miigwech. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'll just uh, jump right into the uh, opening. Um, uh, for the opportunity uh, tonight to bring our hearts and minds together, uh, to recognize our responsibilities uh, to our, our relatives, uh, the plants and other animals uh, who share this beautiful, beautiful earth. Uh, and uh, uh, for us as human beings <clears throat> to contemplate our responsibilities uh, to celebrate life and to uh, work st uh, strategically bring our hearts and minds uh, for uh, the continuance of life. Um, mindful that we are, we are part of this web of life in my language, Jinawe Daganuk, and the laws, the natural laws that uh, flow from that creation. Uh, and those laws can never be uh, violated by human beings um, without suffering consequences. And of course, uh, we're facing that. And protected areas, protected places uh, are an opportunity um, to slow that down, uh, to create spaces where uh, we live more, more in balance. And hopefully that spreads to all of the land. And so with that, I, uh, I'll light uh, the council fire uh, for our session this evening. And uh, I wanna uh, honor and uh, uh, express my appreciation uh, to each and every one of uh, today's uh, participants. Uh, thank you for taking your time this evening uh, to put uh, your heart and mind uh, into uh, the issues of protected places. With that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it back to you, Tim. Miigwech. Thanks so much, Larry. And we'll hear from Larry again uh, later in the agenda, speaking about indigenous protected and conserved areas. Next, we're gonna to go to Dr. Julie Bowen, who's the Boreal Program Manager in Ontario Nature, an NGO dedicated to protecting wild species and wild spaces across Ontario through conservation, education, and public engagement. She lives and works and does amazing, amazing things in Thunder Bay. Thanks for joining us, Julie. Thanks, Tim. And uh, Chimi Gretsch, Larry, for opening our webinar tonight as well. 
As you're not able to gather in person tonight, I will provide a territorial land acknowledgement from where I reside, as Tim said. I'm calling in from Thunder Bay, which was built on the traditional territory of the Fort William First Nation. Here we are all treaty people, and for those of us who live on the shoreline of the Gichigami, also known as Lake Superior, we are signatories to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. These are the homelands of the Anishinaabek, and I also acknowledge the Métis people who live and care for these lands. Through this land acknowledgement, I am reconfirming our commitment to conducting ourselves in the spirit and practice of reconciliation. In practice, this means making space for and supporting Indigenous leadership and knowledge systems in the identification and management of existing and emerging protected areas in Ontario. It means strengthening dialogue with Indigenous communities when invited to do so. And it also means embracing land back initiatives, which will include land repatriation, changes in land governance models, and other tools as deemed necessary by Indigenous communities and nations in order to reestablish their land relationships and stewardship responsibilities. And I'd also like to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Thanks so much, Julie. Next, uh, Jackie Ho, who's Ontario Nature's Protected Areas Coordinator, is going to talk about some of the logistics for this evening, but also has a couple of polling questions that are kind of interesting that uh, she's going to ask you to help her with. Thanks, Tim. So as attendees for tonight's webinar, you'll be in listen-only mode. So we have the chat disabled because there's hundreds of people, but we still want to hear from the four or 500 of you here. You can send in questions via the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen throughout our speakers' presentations. And in a moment, we'll get to learn more about you through our polls. The webinar will also be recorded and be sent out to everyone that has registered for tonight. And we will also be posting it to the story map webpage so that it can easily be found again. The, here's our agenda for tonight. Um, as you can see, we've got an exciting impact list, uh, giving you an overview of the context for expanding Ontario's protected area system and why so many of us are interested and invested in doing more to conserve some special places around the province. And we'll wrap up at the end with a Q&A too. So we hope to answer some of your questions. All right, uh, now we're gonna jump into two quick polls. The first of which should be launching right now. So what watershed are you calling in from? I think this is a fun way to see where people are. Give everyone about 10 more seconds. I'm seeing lots of responses pour in. All right, so as you can see, uh, about 55% of people are calling in from the Lake Ontario watershed, which is not unexpected. Uh, we've also got plenty of Lake Erie and Lake Huron and St. Lawrence representation. And 11% of you are calling in from elsewhere. So thank you for joining us. All right, our next question is launched now. So the question is, why do protected areas matter to you? You can select all that apply. Give everyone about 15 more seconds. This is a longer question, but you can click multiple answers. Okay. 
Perfect. So here are some of the responses. Uh, I love that 99 plus percent of us are here for safeguarding wildlife and nature and habitats. 92% uh, selected nature-based climate solutions. And that's definitely a very vital theme to protected areas. 85% um, at the bottom for health and well-being and lots of others for learning about Indigenous knowledges, opportunities for reconciliation, uh, recreation, and cultural practices. Awesome. Let me close that and we can continue. Great. Thanks so much, Jackie. Um, that was great. Uh, next, we are going to have some context setting introductory comments from Rachel Plotkin, who's the Boreal Program Manager at the David Suzuki Foundation. Uh, David Suzuki Foundation is an NGO that works to protect the natural environment and help create a sustainable Canada through evidence-based research, education, and policy analysis. Thanks for joining us, Rachel. Thank you, Tim. And thank you to everyone taking time out of their Thursday evening to join us. There are a number of different purposes for this webinar. One is for us all to connect and share knowledge about the opportunities to establish new protected areas in Ontario. We also are excited because we have an opportunity to share the story map that collectively um, a number of participants on this webinar and some of the hosts have put together. Um, and to invite further submissions to the story map as they arise. And also to talk about the path forward. What do we do with this information? How can we be advocates for more protected areas in Ontario? And to table some questions and hopefully have time to answer them. I think already a number of, um, it's been acknowledged a number of times that protected areas offer a significant means um, for protecting homes for wildlife species and especially species at risk and as a nature-based solution for the climate crisis. And there's a glowing global net recognition of the need for protected areas, yet that's not necessarily the case of government in Ontario's actions right now. Ontario is a laggard in protected area establishment recently. Um, we're sitting at around 11% protected areas. And although some provinces are really taking significant strides to move forward, Ontario has not moved the needle. It has announced a protected areas working group to make recommendations to the province on um, potential protected area candidates, but that working group is not engaging the public. So that's the primary reason that we're having this webinar as a means of reaching out and engaging with our supporters and people who are interested in protected area establishment. And before we move into the protected area story map, I'm going to quickly walk through a number of different types of protected areas. So the first ones are Indigenous protected and conserved areas. And as Tim mentioned, that is something that Elder Larry McDermott is going to speak to in a moment. There's also the standard provincial and federal protected areas and accompanying conservation reserves and other designations that might be under provincial protected areas. And in addition to that, there's something called other Effective Conservation Measures, or OECMs, something that a lot of us conservationists are familiar with. Um, for an area to be designated as an OECM, conservation doesn't have to be the primary purpose, but it has to be an outcome of the actions that are taken to manage that area. Some examples on our story map are the Queen's University Biological Station um, and two Conservation Authority properties. There's also opportunities for protection to occur on private lands through such mechanisms as land trusts and conservation easements. And finally, at a different scale, um, there's some new strides being taken by municipalities to achieve protected areas. Um, and one example of that is environmentally significant areas in London, Ontario. 
So ultimately, our story map will showcase a number of different areas that are being managed to achieve conservation outcomes. They vary in scale, they vary in management um, designation, but they all work to achieve the goals of protecting nature and they're hopefully something that we can get behind in advance within Ontario. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rachel. And as um, to, to uh, dive in a little bit more, our next guest is uh, uh, John McDonald. And John is the executive director of the uh, Ottawa Valley chapter of the Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, an NGO that works to protect public lands in the Ottawa River watershed of Quebec and Ontario. Uh, welcome, John. I'm not sure where John is, but there's his slides. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. Um, yeah, I'd like to uh, I'd like to uh, start to start off by taking a few moments to uh, to talk about uh, protected areas targets. Um, you know, why are they important? Uh, where do they come from? Uh, how does Ontario compare to other jurisdictions? As well as some of the benefits of protected areas, particularly in terms of our our mental, uh, spiritual, and physical health. So uh, just a little bit of context in terms of, uh, of the protected areas targets. So the, the global policy framework for conservation and protected areas uh, comes from the, uh, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, which was signed back in 1992, at the same time as the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, fast forward to 2010, uh, a 10 year strategic plan was adopted with, uh, with 20 targets known as the ACHI targets. Um, the next slide. And um, the, 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 the target that's really of interest to us is ACHI target 11, which is the protected areas target. And uh, target 11 is interesting because it's really the foundation for protected areas planning in Canada and many countries. And what's interesting about this target is that it's not just uh, about quantity, uh, it's really about quality. And so, you know, we need the right places protected and, and well managed. Um, and uh, so the ACHI target is uh, essentially by 2020 at least 17% of terrestrial and inland water areas and 10% of coastal and marine areas uh, will be protected um, for, for biodiversity. Um, move on to the next slide. And um, uh, Canada adopted uh, target 11 as uh, our target one, which is essentially a, a copy, carbon copy of the, uh, the ACHI target, uh, which is by, again, by 2020, at least 17% of terrestrial areas and inland waters and 10% of the coastal and marine areas are conserved through a network of protected areas. Um, and so there was very little progress for the first uh, five years. And then in, uh, in 2015, uh, we adopted, as I said, target one. And, um, and uh, what's, what's interesting to note here is that uh, Canadians um, overwhelmingly support uh, more conservation. Uh, polls conducted in 2020 show that you know, over 75% of Canadians support the establishment of new protected areas. And, um, and what's interesting here when we talk about the need for you know, all parties to, to sign on to this is that, I mean, there are the obvious um, ecological and environmental benefits of protected areas. But uh, what's also important is that uh, protected areas actually create jobs and bring investment to, uh, to communities, particularly rural and remote communities, uh, you know, which may be impacted by closure, closures in the, in the resource sector. So um, just one, one figure to, uh, to throw out is, uh, is uh, when you look at the um, visitor spending in, uh, in Parks Canada sites across the country, 
there's something like $2.4 billion worth of spending that occurs annually and uh, 28,000 jobs are directly, uh, directly supported uh, in these sites. And, you know, there, there are tens of thousands of other jobs supported in, in provincial and territorial parks uh, right across the country. So this is very, very significant. So, uh, next slide. And um, so I'd just like to take a, a moment to, uh, so where, where are we now? Um, and so we've come a long way on the ocean front um, in the last uh, number of years from 1% uh, to almost 14%. And on the terrestrial side, from about 10% to a little over 13%. Uh, and with uh, a number of projects that have been funded through the uh, historic investments in conservation and budgets uh, 2018 and 2021, uh, we're well on our way to the 17% um, goal. And, uh, and uh, you, know, you know, how does Ontario compare to some other jurisdictions? Um, Quebec, for, for example, uh, reached uh, its 17% target back in December. And, um, you know, Quebec set high and ambitious targets, but it had strong Indigenous and public support. And, um, and with uh, a number of sites in southern Quebec that have yet to be designated, um, you know, Quebec is on track to reach 22% by 2022. And, uh, I mean, it's entirely feasible that Quebec will reach 25% and, uh, and 30% and um, positioning the, the province as not only a national leader in terms of conservation, but really a global leader. And, um, and um, you know, you look at some of the other big announcements across the country, uh, you know, Thai Dene Nene in the, in the NWT, the Peel River watershed in the Yukon. Uh, these are huge areas that were announced uh, in, in, uh, in, in the last couple of years. Um, and, uh, and, and the, the game changer here has been, um, you know, federal, federal commitments and, um, and, and funding has really been key to incentivize provinces to, and territories to act. Uh, next slide. And then, uh, uh, earlier this fall, Canada joined a, uh, a group of, uh, of countries like France, uh, Costa Rica, Finland, and uh, other global leaders in championing the 30% by, uh, by 2030 target, both on, on land and in sea. And, that's, um, and, and by doing so, we, we not only reaffirmed our own commitment to, uh, to a massive expansion of protected areas, but we really positioned ourselves as a global leader in terms of protected areas as well. Um, next slide. And uh, as the, the, you know, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has uh, illustrated, um, you know, the, there's a, you know, we're really in a new context for nature. Uh, there's a, you know, massive renewed interest in uh, public interest in nature. Uh, nature is really seen as an essential service uh, by, uh, by many people. Um, there's a, a greater awareness as well of our actions on nature. Uh, you know, now more than ever, uh, the conditions, uh, in my opinion, are right for a major expansion in, uh, in, uh, in protected areas. And as I said earlier, you know, the public support is there for, uh, for, for protected areas. And uh, there's going to be, you know, trillions of dollars of public, of public funds spent in the next, you know, couple of years to, you know, reboot the economy. And so that's a real opportunity that we have at this point in time to, um, to really look at some transformational change. And, uh, and I think protected areas are, are key to that, uh, that economic recovery. Um, next slide. And uh, just to wrap up, in terms of some of the, the benefits of protected areas, uh, there's been a, there's a, so much research has been uh, conducted recently in terms of the, the health benefits of protected areas. And, uh, you know, we see that for, 
uh, at a number of levels. I mean, protected areas uh, foster social connections, which are you know vital to our healthy communities. Um, you know, we see that uh, for children, whether that's uh, you know urban parks or more wilderness areas, uh, there's a, a number of physical and cognitive as well as social benefits that can be derived from spending time in nature and having access to to nature. Uh, you know, the same thing for adolescents. Um, uh, you know, during a sort of a for many many kids. Uh, a challenging time in their life. And so there's uh, a lot of opportunities there to improve mental and social health. And then, uh, you know, the same thing among older adults in particular, you know, being active outdoors is, uh, is extremely important. And, um, and we've seen a number of really interesting programs being developed uh, across Canada and around the world. And one that I'd like to, uh, to flag is a, a program in the US National Parks called the uh, Parks Prescription Program, which uh, where uh, doctors will actually prescribe time in nature to their patients to treat a range of uh, chronic conditions such as diabetes, depression, um, high blood pressure, and that often includes things like, uh, you know, referrals for walking, yoga, uh, park-based after-school programs for youth. So it's, uh, it's really interesting to see this uh, this renewed appreciation for uh, for nature, and um, and uh, you know communities like Ottawa, where where the, the Ottawa region where I live, uh, you know we're consistently ra ranked as one of the best places to live in the country, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that there is so much nature uh, nearby, whether that's National Capital Greenbelt or Gatineau Park, and so. Uh, protected areas, in addition to you know providing jobs and uh, and the, the the host of ecosystem services they provide, um, you know also support uh, you know healthy 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 people, healthy communities. So uh, with that, I will uh, turn it back to you. Thanks so much, John. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, and I know about, looks like about 75 or so joined after we got started, um, you are at the uh, Your Protected Places webinar, a shared vision for Ontario, where we're uh, talking about protected areas and their establishment and their values uh, here uh, in Ontario and across Canada. Next, uh, we have uh, Larry McDermott again, who's going to speak to us about Indigenous protected and conserved areas. And as John mentioned, this has become the a leading mechanism for the creation of uh, protected areas in Canada. And, and Larry's going to speak to, uh, to how these work and uh, why they're so important for the future of protected areas establishment and biodiversity conservation uh, in Ontario and Canada. Larry. Thank you, Tim. Um, yeah, just, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start by saying uh, uh, in 92 at the Earth Summit, which I was part of the uh, Indigenous delegation from Canada. Uh, the uh, Indigenous ways of knowing were I identified as one of the major streams of knowledge uh, that would be needed to achieve uh, the vision at that time. And in 2010, I, I also uh, traveled to Japan uh, and just want to mention that uh, HE Target uh, 18 recognizes uh, indigenous knowledge systems and uh, in the inclusiveness of indigenous uh, peoples uh, when uh, they are interested in activities that support the uh, goals and targets of uh, uh, the Convention on Biodiversity. Now, indigenous protected and, and conserved areas, um, I think it's important to, to recognize in the short period of time I have right now, uh, I have to fly over the mountaintops, but uh, I just want to say that this country came together based on sharing the land and based on uh, the, um, uh, the vision of between 2,000 and 2,500 chiefs who uh, convened uh, at the Treaty of Niagara uh, in 1764, uh, taking action uh, from the Royal Proclamation of 1763 enshrined in Canada's constitution. At that time, there was concern about uh, overfishing, over harvest of, uh, of trees and a, a failure to um, understand natural law. Uh, and uh, uh, in the Royal 
uh, Commission on Aboriginal Peoples in the 90s, uh, there one elder in particular spoke about how natural law is the one law that human beings uh, can't change. And that when we violate it, we uh, hurt ourselves, we hurt the, uh, the web of life. So uh, IPCAs are protected areas that are uh, based in part on the vision of our ancestors. And I, I just noted a, a few points when our ancestors uh, came together uh, and, uh, and worked on a vision that uh, uh, created uh, the, the country we know as, as Canada. And um, so uh, Indigenous uh, IPCAs are led obviously by Indigenous peoples. Uh, they're, they uh, come with the long-term commitment and uh, they elevate uh, Indigenous uh, cultural practices around conservation and in, included and inherent in that process uh, are uh, Indigenous responsibilities and rights. Uh, and so Canada in um, yeah, 2018, uh, it, uh, after identifying uh, uh, H and Target 11 as a priority, convened the Indigenous Circle of Experts, uh, also the National Advisory Panel, and uh, produced reports that identified uh, the, the importance of moving forward, of transforming uh, uh, conservation. And IPCAs were uh, an outcome of that uh, Pathways One process. And there are numerous uh, activities, uh, First Nations, uh, Métis and Inuit people were in, involved in uh, IPCAs. And along with that, a Guardians program that is culturally based to look after uh, these protected areas. It should be uh, understood that uh, IPCAs uh, come when indigenous nations uh, determine the lands and, and waters they want to include in them. There's usually extensive uh, community planning uh, and they reflect indigenous laws and traditions and ensure indigenous peoples can maintain uh, their relationship with these lands. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, indigenous legal systems uh, are usually um, are often uh, the underpinning of IPCAs and then through partnership agreements with uh, crown governments uh, these nation-to-nation uh, -nation agreements are constructed often pretty complex uh, there's there's some great stories uh, among the uh, IPCA um, uh, community. Um, I, I think what else is uh, important to know uh, is that um, though they're Indigenous led, it's important. Partnerships are very important and it's part of the vision. Uh, and so they may be co-designated co as national parks or national wildlife areas or provincial. Uh, there are a number of uh, partnership uh, relationships. Um, that emerge from them. I'd uh, love to be able to have elaborated on the um, Indigenous Circle of Experts uh, report that went to uh, Pathways One, but I think one of the key areas is that human beings are part of nature. And I'm even thinking of the National Advisory Panel's recommendations on um, accepting the Indigenous worldview that uh, we are one species among many sharing this land and that uh, Canada uh, should achieve its conservation goals through a spirit of reconciliation. Uh, and IPCAs are intended to be lands uh, where that vision is, uh, is given life. Um, but it, it's also important to know that uh, each uh, First Nation or Métis group or, or Inuit uh, community determines its pri own priorities. Uh, and um, the, one of the uh, uh, key uh, points of uh, indigenous uh, protected and conserved areas is that they aren't divorced from uh, sustaining uh, livelihoods, that uh, human beings, uh, that indigenous peoples 
uh, <clears throat> continue to live on the lands as they uh, always have, that they uh, uh, drive a, uh, an economic relationship uh, from the land, but uh, uh, especially when they're buoyed in indigenous law, uh, most, if not all, indigenous legal systems are based on natural law, um, accepting that we have a responsibility to other species. And when we um, harm uh, the life givers, when we harm the land, when we harm the water, when we harm other species, we harm ourselves. Uh, and so that's that uh, uh, point of view as uh, it's generally what guides indigenous uh, governments and peoples uh, on IPCAs. And I'd, lastly, I, I'm going to say that uh, I, IPCAs are an opportunity uh, for um, what uh, uh, Elder Albert Marshall refers to, Mi'kmaq Elder, as two-eyed seeing. So it's an opportunity to come together and look at the strengths of Western science and indigenous ways of knowing uh, to bring those uh, disciplines together and to uh, work toward um, a, a way of living on the land that respects uh, uh, not only our children, but seven generations ahead. Also reflects on the, uh, the wisdom of uh, our ancestors, certainly at least seven generations before us and our responsibilities to them as good caretakers to do at least as well as they did, uh, but always striving to do better. So that very quickly is uh, my synopsis of IPCAs. And uh, uh, thank you for listening. Thanks so much, Larry, that was great. Um, next, we're going to hear from um, uh, Michelle Cantor on the importance of and opportunities uh, for protected areas in Southern Ontario. As folks know, Southern Ontario is, is highly developed, agriculture, a lot of the cities we live in, uh, making particular challenges for the establishment of protected areas. Uh, Michelle is the Executive Director of Carolinian Canada, a network of leaders growing healthy landscapes for a green future in the Carolinian zone in the spirit and practice of reconciliation. Thanks for joining us, Michelle. Thanks, Tim, and thanks, Larry. Um, I think in the conservation sector, we're very good at cataloging our losses and it always um, gives me great inspiration and hope uh, listening to uh, the, the, the grounding of natural law. Uh, so I'm going to move from that uh, grounding to a very uh, busy landscape of Southern Ontario. Um, can we do protected areas on this complex landscape? I would say the conversation is much bigger than obviously just the people on this webinar. Um, and I'm gonna share what I know from the Carolinian zone perspective. And part of, I'm also part of the Southern Ontario Nature Coalition, but I only know a small piece of it. So um, uh, I'll, I'll let you make the extrapolations. Uh, Southern Ontario, what I've learned over um, my career is that it's a really critical piece of biodiversity in um, Canada and Ontario, and yet it's one of the most neglected places for conservation and protected areas. Next slide, please. Shockingly, this region has only 0.6% protected area according to the Auditor General. This is far below the 17% or even um, obviously the 30% by 2030 recommended by the UN. This area is home to 40% of Canada's biodiversity. So we can't use the excuse that the significant ecosystems in this region are represented elsewhere in our protected area systems. And with climate change, species at the northern edge of their range are becoming even more important to protect biodiversity. Genetics matters. This is 30% of Canada's genetic resources. Next slide, please. But can it be done in Southern Ontario? I think a lot of people just throw up their hands and walk away. How do we go on a private landscape from less than 1% to 17%? 
Apparently in Canada recently completed a big picture protected area strategy that was an eye opener. It brought together some of the leading thinkers in protected areas in Southern Ontario. And they identified that yes, it's complex and yes, it's a challenge, but yes, it's possible. They identified the need and the opportunities to increase protected areas through a multi-pronged approach showing it is possible and imperative and all the complex ingredients are actually in place. We just need the investment. I'll introduce you to some of these opportunities and examples really quickly, a very high level and brief overview of thousands of opportunities on our doorstep to accelerate protected areas. Next slide, please. And we, next slide, please. Sorry. Uh, we always have to start with IPCAs. IPCAs are happening in Southern Ontario very quietly. Walpole Island Land Trust is a groundbreaking program running for many years with great success to protect some of the most significant ecosystems in Canada. A couple of years ago, Chippewas of the Thames First Nation passed a ban council resolution to protect 250 acres of highly uh, significant and diverse ecosystem. Six Nations works to secure and restore land in the Haldeman Tract and the list goes on and on. Six, uh, there are many more opportunities for leadership, collaboration and reconciliation. IPCAs can be accelerated with investment for land, capacity building, intergenerational opportunities and more. And they are a priority as Larry pointed out for all those reasons, but also because we have a lot to learn Indigenous leaders steward 80% of the world's biodiversity. And I think that's reflected in the, in the Southern Ontario. There is so much opportunity to work together to create ethical space and activate new ways of caring for the landscape with Indigenous knowledge on and off reserve because we all live on traditional territory. Next slide, please. And as has been mentioned, uh, as Rachel mentioned, uh, conservation authorities are an important part of the protected area system. They're the second largest protected area owner in the province, owning almost 150,000 hectares. And they aren't counted as Canada Target One at this point. They need to be counted. The unofficial count in the Carolinian zone puts us at about 2.5% protected area. And they're community gems. Rock Glen here is a part of a Sobel Bayfield Conservation Authority's 9,000 acres of protected area on private landscape. And it takes patient commitment over many years to secure sites cost effectively, uh, taking opportunities to secure land when they become available. Conservation authorities are well positioned in local communities to support ongoing protection opportunities for many co-benefits, especially related to water, climate, risk, and recreation. Next slide, please. Similarly, municipalities steward thousands of hectares of parkland that should be assessed, restored, and counted. City of London, as was mentioned, was the first municipality here that assessed their ESAs, adding 735 hectares to the official count for Canada Target One. We could duplicate that, or we could multiply that over hundreds of other municipalities with a cost-effective investment in supporting a community of practice and equitable access to technical assistance. Next slide, please. Land trusts should also be counted and supported for their long-term securement opportunities. Skunk's Misery is an example, only one example of hundreds showing how working within an agriculture context, significant habitat is being protected by Thames Talbot Land Trust and other partners. This 3,600 hectare ANSI and PSW is now 30% protected, is home to over 50 provincially rare species, 24 federally listed species at risk. It is one of the largest Carolinian forests remaining and Thames Talbot Land Trust has a long-term securement plan that is investment ready. Next slide, please. OECM's 
can include conservation easements has been noted in Southern Ontario, Ontario Farmland Trust and other land trusts hold easements for working landscapes where biodiversity is protected under private ownership. These opportunities could be maximized with targeted investments to empower private landowners and businesses. Biodiversity is a big win for any sustainability framework as it protects soil, pollinators, and 30% of our genetic resources, as noted. And they may become, that may become a future crop or medicine. By letting this natural capital and resource disappear, we are limiting our options for the future as a society. So these green leaders, these landowners are building capacity and eco-literacy for sustainable land stewardship in the greater park ecosystem and establishing critical connections for wildlife, people and food systems. Next slide, please. Engaging landowners starts long before a land donation or easement takes place. Growing a culture of nature was identified by the Big Picture Protected Areas Task Force as a fundamental first step to increase protected areas. It builds eco-literacy, it, it creates votes for nature. Our In the Zone program shows that 25,000 hectares are available now for habitat improvements. This work in itself would support 14 UN sustainable development goals and kickstart a green economy and create a critical continuum of engagement across a cultural landscape. And this would just naturally create more protected area opportunities over time. We can't start from zero. We need investment in restoration that will lead to protected areas. Next slide, please. The new report from the Southern Ontario Nature Coalition shows that there's a huge opportunity, hundreds and thousands of hectares for more protected lands in the greater Golden Horseshoe, including some that are already ceded crown lands. Next slide. A coordinated approach is needed on a complex landscape. Opportunities include IPCAs, provincial wildlife areas, areas of natural and scientific interest, and more. Next slide, please. It takes coordinated action. And on the ground, Southern Ontario could host a strong and diverse protected area network through a coordinated and targeted approach. Next slide. And people and businesses are ready to invest in protected areas. We recently, Carolyn Canada recently engaged partners, investors and landowners to launch the Deshkan ZB Conservation Impact Bond for Healthy Landscapes that includes protected areas. The time is right to invest in nature. People and businesses want it. There's clear opportunity for government leadership. Next slide, please. I shared a very brief story of what is happening here in Southern Ontario and where the opportunities might lie, but it won't happen without participation from everyone. You are part of the story. Do you want more than 0.6% protect, protected areas in Southern Ontario? Share your story and save your place for a healthy green future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michelle. And next uh, we're going to turn to our uh, look at the story map that was introduced a little bit earlier on in this presentation as uh, something that was going to be uh, highlighted tonight and introduced to you all. Uh, so to do that, we have Jackie Ho and Dr. M. Val, the Director of Conservation Education at Ontario Nature. Uh, Jackie and Anne, um, take it away. Thanks, Tim. So Jackie, you have to let me know when we're ready to start. You can get started. I just wanted to show everyone the link to where oh, they can find okay. the story map. And okay. I will switch screens. Oh, but where are we not showing this? Okay. We're showing the story map though, right? Yeah, we're here. Excellent. Thank you so much. So good evening, everyone. Um, I hope you've been enjoying the webinar so far. And before I go any further, I just wanted to say uh, a big thank you to the David Suzuki Foundation that provided the financial uh, support both for uh, the webinar and for the development of this story map. So we're going to unveil the story map, which is a collective uh, creation featuring candidate protected areas across Ontario. Brought forward by individuals and organizations from Windsor to Ottawa, over to Thunder Bay and farther west even than that. 
Um, and before we go further, I'd also like to say a huge thanks to Jackie, who's the technical wizard who put all of this together. It, it uh, is far beyond me. So I want to, to stress the opportunity. Um, this is an open-ended project. This whole idea of the story map is an open-ended project. And what we're showing you tonight is just the beginning. Um, after this evening, we want to continue to work together to define and articulate a collective vision for protected areas in Ontario. Protecting the areas we love in the spirit and practice of reconciliation. That's what this is all about. So in the weeks and the months ahead, with your support, we plan to keep adding to and expanding this story map, and we hope that you will help us promote it. This is this is a, a supposed to be a collective vision where we come together and let our political leaders know, political leaders of all stripes, that people want this. We want to demonstrate to the government and all parties that um, we expect them to uh, commit to the new targets. We expect them to commit to them and we expect them to achieve those targets. And as you can see, um, John McDonald mentioned earlier, they're ambitious targets, 25% by 2025 and 30% by 2030 but they are targets that are supported by scientists around the world and achieving them is absolutely necessary. So the story map is kind of the first steps in presenting a bit of a path forward. In terms of why it matters, we've heard a fair bit tonight about all the benefits of protected areas. And I guess it's, it's you know, I can simply say that they are the cornerstone of biodiversity conservation. They're not the whole story, but they are an absolutely critical piece, especially given the urgency of the, of the challenges that we face today. Um, and they provide so many benefits, again, as we've already heard um, from numerous speakers um, today. So Jackie is going to walk you through the actual map part of the story map. And uh, so far it highlights 189 candidate protected areas across Ontario. There are some spots that have a lot of, of, of uh, candidates and others that don't. But ideally we would just like to fill the map with this vision of all of these places that people care about and want to protect as we try to move forward um, to, achieve, to achieve the big targets. Great, so as you can see, this is a web page. Um, and there's lots of information here, so I hope people can take the time tonight or in the coming days to kind of take a look at everything that's available here. Um, the main feature of our webpage is this story map here. So let me expand it first. Um, you can see here that we have lots of sites shown that have been identified over years of work by local community groups, indigenous communities, forestry companies even, and environmental supporters like you. So I will just highlight a few examples. Um, the orange sites have been some of the sites that we've really gathered from um, local communities. And you can click on individual sites to pull up a description about them. One example here, for example, is the Faribault Peninsula in Northwestern Ontario. It's a very significant cultural site and a really amazing place for birds and rare plants. Um, and there's a local coalition, including Eagle Lake First Nation, um, that are seeking permanent protection here. So as we scroll down here, you can see information about the site and you can see some of the beautiful photos that have been submitted alongside this site. Um, the red sites here are sites that have been identified by forest, forest companies that have been certified through the Forest Stewardship Council process. Um, through this process, these forestry companies have to identify areas of significance that they won't log in. And Ontario Nature has done significant research into this and you can um, find more about that in our report. Um, and you can see here, for example, Caribou Zone 3, some information about the site and a photo of Woodland Caribou. 
Um, and lastly, we can go down to southern Ontario, where we have lots of sites, at least in the central and eastern portion. Um, one site here that's pretty interesting is that we've included parts of Algonquin Provincial Park. So parts of Algonquin Park um, are not fully considered to be protected because industrial logging continues. And a group, uh, a local group has studied um, and analyzed some of the road last roadless areas available here. The Ancient Forest Exploration and Research Group. You can check out some of their work on their website, um, but you can see on the map here that uh, they've identified roadless areas within the park and, and some roadless areas adjacent to the park. So I hope everyone will take some time to explore the hundreds of almost 200 sites on this map. Back to you, Anne. Thanks, Jackie. Um, so after the map itself, we we um, outline some of the opportunities because there's some big opportunities, and you and you get to realize that, especially as you start to look at, at these various individual sites. Um, so the first opportunity we've heard about it tonight, and, and I'll just reiterate it again, is the opportunity represented by Indigenous protected and conserved areas. And there are a few spots on the map that have come forward as, as IPCAs and others that, that may down the road. At this point, um, in, in some cases, it's not clear whether IPCA would be the protect, protection mechanism that would be um, used at the end of the day, but uh, certainly there are lots and lots of opportunities. Another uh, big opportunity is, is wetlands. Wetlands are, are a key feature of many of the candidate protected areas presented on the story map, and obviously for good reason, considering their vital importance from both a biodiversity conservation and from a climate change um, perspective and species at risk as well. Um, and the interesting thing about wetlands is that there are so many in Ontario and uh, the, the, the opportunities are vast on private land and on public land as well. Another big opportunity are our forests. They're a key feature in, in, in most uh, of the candidate sites and several of them include old growth forests, which I think is, is something that you know is definitely meriting some close attention. To, to think, you know, we've got the, the big fight happening in BC right now, um, but um, we're going to be having big fights here in Ontario too, because there are still many significant old growth forests that, that um, are vulnerable to um, damage and destruction. Uh, another big opportunity are ecological corridors. There are several candidate sites that would protect significant ecological corridors often providing important connections between um, existing uh, core natural areas. They vary in size. For example, um, we've got one that's called the Pefferlaw Wildlands Complex. That's about 1500 hectares. But we've got another, the Highlands Corridor, which would connect um, Queen Elizabeth II Wildlands Provincial Park and Kawartha Highlands Provincial Park. And that's um, over 70,000 hectares in size. So big and small, but equally important for, for that connectivity piece at the landscape level. Jackie's mentioned FSC, but that obviously is another huge opportunity on the story map. Um, we have identified what we, forestry companies in Ontario that are FSC certified, have identified over a million hectares of candidate protected areas. Um, so these are, these are candidate protected areas identified by industry in consultation with First Nations and, and stakeholders. Um, but they're not yet protected. There's no pathway, no policy pathway to move them forward. So that's a, that's a huge opportunity. Um, next, uh, and, and Michelle has referred to this already, but it's, it's uh, the near urban nature piece. Um, you know, this ties in as well with what John said about, about the health message. Increasing access uh, to nature for everyone is an objective that many of us embrace. And I think it's, it's a question of equity and it's a question of fairness and it's a question of so many things. And that's one of the reasons why protecting nature near, urban, near our towns and cities is just so important to provide access for everyone. Um, and again, another huge opportunity is Southern Ontario. Um, 
We have several candidate sites identified in Southern Ontario, but we need many more. It's a high priority for all the reasons that Michelle outlined. Hugely important from a biodiversity perspective um, and very, very little protected, 0.6%. But there are some really, you know, Michelle talked a fair bit about the private land opportunities, which are considerable and which are vital. But interestingly, there are also some really uh, good opportunities on, the, on um, unceded crown land as well. For example, there's, there are over 45,000 hectares of provincially significant wetlands in Southern Ontario on unceded crown land. And there are over 57,000 hectares of areas of natural and scientific interest in Southern Ontario on uh, unceded crown land. So those are huge spaces um, where, where you know, we can protect nature without actually having to buy it, which is the challenge on, on so much of our, our private lands. And the final opportunity that we've highlighted in the story map is, is simply expanding protected areas. It really makes a lot of sense in terms of buffering and connecting um, important core natural areas that are protected in the parks already. Another interesting example, um, there are almost 3 million hectares of areas of natural scientific interest adjacent to or within two kilometers of, of uh, provincial parks and conservation reserves. That's a huge opportunity. Um, almost, you know, almost all of it on on uh, on unceded crown land. So the opportunities are there. The challenge is going to be to convince our political leaders to actually make the commitment that's needed, and then to develop a plan and and go for it. Um, so that's essentially what's going to be the discussion in, in the remaining time in, in the webinar. Katie Krilov is going to lead that discussion. So um, I just wanted to point it out at the very end. She's going to lead the discussion on next steps, but at the very bottom here, you see it says video recording of the Your Protected Places webinar. That's where you will find the video, video recording of this webinar once we get it all tidied up and put onto the, um, put onto the story map. Okay, so now um, I'm going to pass uh, the mic over to Katie. Thanks, everyone. Okay, hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Katie uh, Krelov. I am the Ontario campaigner for the Wilderness Committee. Um, and yeah, and I'm going to lead the part of the webinar where we at least hope we've got some time to kind of turn things over to you. So we are gonna get to some of the questions that some of the many questions that people have posted. Um, but I also just want to say that we're also turning it over to you in the sense of thinking about next steps and actions that we all can take uh, over the next year to move this inclusive, ambitious and emerging vision for protected places and targets forward on the ground in Ontario. Um, so as has been mentioned at various points already in the webinar, um, several factors uh, are, have been sort of coming together uh, to open up a political moment uh, to do just that. And so the story map that we've started to develop is just the, the jumping off point and to try to put all of the, um, to put that vision together in one place that we can all uh, move forward. So some of those, uh, so some of those um, things that are happening to create this moment uh, were mentioned at the beginning. So of course the the global targets that Canada has signed on to in terms of percentage of protected places, um, which Ontario, as was mentioned, has been a huge laggard in achieving. Um, but um, also recently the Ontario government has made a move towards that by putting together a working committee to make recommendations on um, expanding protected places. So there is a little bit of a signal that um, this particular government is realizing that it needs to move forward on uh, expanding protected places. Um, but as was also mentioned, unfortunately, that process has been very closed um, and narrow. So 
really part of the vision of the story map is to open up that process and to uh, include everyone's voices and visions for what for what we can have for protected places and how we want to move forward on that. Uh, and then also certainly the lead up to the 2022 provincial election is an opportunity for us all to work together to secure commitments from all political candidates and parties to expand Ontario's protected areas. Um, and those commitments need to have strong targets as we've talked about to protect at least 25% of lands and waters by 2025 and 30% by 2030. Uh, and doing that in the spirit and practice of reconciliation and with free prior and informed consent of and leadership from indigenous peoples. Uh, so political parties should also be compelled to pledge to address the chronic underfunding of Ontario's protected areas uh, that was actually recently um, pointed out in the Auditor General of Ontario's um, 2020 report on protected areas. Um, so that's another uh, recent uh, development that has kind of created this moment for pushing a, a bold vision for protected areas uh, forward. Um, so um, if uh, Jackie, if you can just move to the next slide. So just to start us off, here are some things that you can do right away. Um, so again, that story map and a lot of the questions that I've been seeing in the Q&A uh, are talking about specific sites that people are passionate about and wanna know uh, how to move forward in terms of the vision for protected places. So yeah, that story map is evolving and right on the site, you can um, add uh, your vision for a protected place, right? So you can upload your particular um, site, special place onto that map. Um, and you can also share it with your friends and families and neighbors far and, 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 and representatives on government far and wide. Uh, you can also get involved with a site near you. So you can look on the map and click on it and find out what groups, what people are working on sites near you and find out how to get involved in pushing forward for protection for that site. Um, you can email your MPP. Um, so recently, a lot of the groups that were involved in uh, putting together this webinar did send uh, a letter to all MPPs um, in support of of the working group's mandate to add to protected areas and also asking for uh, strong targets and that it be an open and public process. Uh, and so you can email your MPP and register it with them right away that that is something that is important to you. Uh, there is a link there on the slide where that will make it easier to send that letter to your MPP that the Wilderness Committee has. Um, and help us put protected areas on the map for Ontario election 2022, right? So, I mean, once, once, once election things start happening, bringing this up uh, as, as frequently as possible with, with candidates, parties, all parties and, 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 and sitting elected leaders um, is, is what we need at this point. And then um, another upcoming, um, webinar, more of a conference that is going to actually get into the nitty gritty of some of, of, some, of some of the specific sites is called the peoplesummit.ca. So you can check out that website and, uh, and, and get involved and find out all uh, more about specific candidate protection areas. Um, so we do have a little poll, another poll. Jackie, do we have that poll ready? Yes, we do. Just to sort of uh, inspire you, we're going to ask you what uh, you might be willing to do off the top of your head. What will you do to advance the vision of your protected places? So if people want to fill that out, and I'm going to check out some of our questions here.
I'll give it about 10 more seconds. You can select multiple answers again. There's no one right answer. The more the better. Great. Here are the results, Katie. All right, so great. It looks like 70% will share the story map and vision with your network. That's huge. Talking to your neighbors, keeping the discussion going, uh, you know, talking about how Ontario is falling way behind in, um, in, in adding to our protected places network and the importance of doing that is so important. Joining a local group, write to your member, your MPP or other government representative. Meeting with your MPP, it's low down there. I know it seems so hard, but it actually is, is pretty easy. And, and, and in terms of protected areas, it's not a hard sell, you know, like you're never going to talk to an MPP who's going to say, no, I don't support adding to protected areas network. You know what I mean? So in terms of that meeting, it's great. It's just laying out the details for them and how it can be done and that people support it. So I just want to put that little earworm in your mind that meeting with your MPP is not as hard as it sounds. Um, awesome. Great. So we are going to get to some um, of your questions and we have a lot of questions here. Uh, and a lot of them are about specific sites. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to leave those questions and an answer to those that we fully encourage uploading sites onto the story map and getting your sites up there. I do have a bunch of questions uh, that have to do with the targets um, that John was talking about and also the definition of protected. Uh, so maybe I'll throw a bunch of those out and John and maybe um, I feel like you're well positioned to answer those. Uh, and they're pretty quick answers too. So why 17% for conserved protected areas? Where does the number come from? And I can actually jump in there and say, from what I know, that number is completely a political number and not a scientific number. And if you, and scientific studies actually show that we need more like 50% protected. But anyways, I'll leave John to address that as well. Uh, and were the 2020 targets met by most of the signatories? And then the other one I'll throw in there is, what is the definition of a protected place? So I'll open that up to all our panelists. Which one are we starting with, Katie? So I sort of thought those three could go together. So let's like 17% conserved, where does that number come from? How far has it been met in terms of the signatories to the to the um, UN Biodiversity Council? Mm -hmm. And then, Def, what is a protected place, anyways? What's the definition? So, John, maybe you want to handle the seventeen percent questions. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Katie. I mean, you're uh, you're absolutely right. Um, the seventeen percent is really. Uh, uh, largely a compromise more than anything um, at the uh, the the ACHI conference. Uh, you know, some jurisdictions were pushing for you know very ambitious targets. I mean, some countries are are way out ahead of us, uh, and other jurisdictions were pushing for more uh, more restrained uh, uh, targets. And so, seventeen percent was a, a bit of a compromise. It's not uh, unfortunately not based on any. Any real science, um, you know, I think the science is telling us that anywhere from 30 to 70% of any given ecosystem needs to be protected. Um, and then um, in terms of the other question, in terms of how does Ontario compare? Um, so uh, nationally in Canada, we're at about 13, a little over 13%. And um, other jurisdictions in Canada, sort of just off the top of my head, uh, British Columbia is at about 19.5. Uh, the Northwest Territories at about 15.8. Um, and then you have places like New Brunswick, uh, which and Nova Scotia and um, New Brunswick and Newfoundland, which are more around five, five or six percent. So uh, there's a bit of a range right across the country. Okay, great. Yeah, and I'll just add there to clarify that. 
uh, Canada has signed on to the post 2020 targets of 25% protected by 2025 and 30% protected by 2030. Uh, which brings us to sort of a bunch of questions. Yeah, to the question of how do we define protected and what sort of activities are allowed or not allowed in protected areas? So I don't know, Anne, do you want to, do you want to handle? Sure, I can, I can take a, a crack at that, Katie. Uh, it reminds me of, you know, 20 years ago that the definition was um, kind of areas where no, no industrial activity are allowed. That was kind of the simple understanding of it. But um, now with the, uh, the, the federal counting towards the big protected areas target, um, they have to be areas that are, are clearly defined, that are protected for the long term, that have management frameworks in place that, that will address all harmful activities, and that actually achieve the conservation outcomes that they're intended to, to achieve. So activities have to be managed so that at the end of the day, biodiversity is not harmed and, and conservation is achieved. Okay, great. And um... uh, you know what, Katie, I'll just add to that. So, so you know, obviously there are different levels of protection in different ways, but protected areas, the way we're talking about them here tonight, protected areas that, that meet the criteria I, I just discussed, um, it's not the same as a sort of land use planning protections. So for instance, the green belt does not meet the criteria to count towards, towards the big federal target because it's, it's open to, um, to lots of activities that are actually harmful to biodiversity, be that aggregates extraction or infra infrastructure development and so on. So though it provides definitely a very important level of protection, it doesn't provide that uh, high level of protection that is needed to count as a protected area. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, we did have a bunch of question about, about planning, uh, planning process, uh, provincial planning process areas like MZOs and conservation authority areas. So, I mean, if you wanna delve a little bit more deeper into that, feel free. But I will also just, uh, I did note one, um, question that you wanted to answer was, can any of the partners on the call provide an update on projects that were funded by Canada Nature Fund, specifically under the Spaces Stream, um, the Pathway to Canada Target One Challenge? Did you want to answer that one, Anne? I don't know enough about it, Katie. I know, for example, that um, the Southern Ontario Nature Coalition that, that uh, Michelle mentioned earlier, we're also part of that. And that was funded through the through the big fund. There are some um, sites on the map, um, IPCA sites that have been um, that have received federal funding. Um, but I honestly I don't know enough about all of that to, to comment. Maybe I'm not sure whether anyone else on the call knows the answer to that. I guess not. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, I do have a, well, there's a lot of questions about the role of municipalities in securing protected places. Um, I wonder if anyone has any comp, uh, thoughts about the role of municipalities. Jackie, would you like to tackle that one, given the, the work that you did? Sure. Um, I did answer one of the questions about this. So the City of London was chosen as kind of a pilot municipality um, to participate in the Canada Target One process. Um, other municipalities uh, we're aware of are starting to go through this assessment process as well for some of their municipal-owned parks, natural areas, environmentally significant lands, or even county forests. Um, there, there is a 
standard that's used nationally um, that you can find at the Conservation 2020 Canada website. And in Ontario, the, the uh, I guess the, the main group or the assessor um, is the Ministry of uh, environment conservation and parks. And um, we know that there's some staff there that are actively working with municipalities to assess more lands. All right, thanks, thanks Jackie. Um, I'm just checking our time here. Okay, so we've got a few more minutes. Hmm. Katie. Okay, it's Larry. Uh, I could add to that last question. Okay. Uh, so I got an, an email uh, today and I noticed uh, Gord Harrison asked a question uh, more generally, but our local conservation authority uh, announced that uh, a number of protected areas uh, that fall under their jurisdiction, um, they'll no longer be able to uh, ask out of the general levy um, for funds to maintain even parking lots to access those those uh, protected areas. And they named them off. And I know a couple of the sites are, are very rich in biodiversity. Uh, so I suspect that's uh, happening across the, the province. So the shrinkage of what is a core mandate for municipalities um, and who get most uh, of their revenues from municip municipalities uh, will have some impact um, uh, under that, under the municipal or local government umbrella. So that just, uh, that's one thought. That earlier question was uh, about uh, the challenge fund was very specific. I don't know that particular stream. I do know of uh, IPCAs in Ontario, um, but uh, I couldn't, answer the question, it was just too, um, too narrow uh, for me. I just don't know that particular stream of uh, the challenge fund. So thank you. Um, okay, also I have a couple questions here too around um, resources for people. Um, so one is, do we have a media kit uh, that, sorry. Just lost it. Do we have a media kit uh, that people can use when talking uh, that you can share with folks when we're talking to people and elected officials and people of influence? A lot of questions about getting this, uh, this vision into schools as well, which is kind of awesome. Uh, will this initiative be brought to school boards to become a major subject? Young people must know what is happening and how very important this is to their future lives. Does anyone wanna touch on those in terms of, of resources? That is something, Katie, it's Anne again. I think that's something that we, we need to take away and think about because there are resources. I just don't know them off the top of my head. I know they're on our website and I know um, that Environmental Defense and, and Yours to Protect, they've been putting together resources as well. The Greenbelt Foundation, uh, Ontario Greenbelt Alliance has been doing the same. So those kinds of resources about how to meet with, with your elected officials and, and that, those exist. Um, so maybe that's one thing that we can take away and then send out by email to the to the webinar participants. Okay, and I just I actually have a really quick question. Can Crown land be considered as part of the protected areas or are these lands considered protected already? I see a smile in Larry, you answer that question. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you answered that question with the um, map of Algonquin Park, that's Crown land. Um, but it depends on uh, how the Crown land, uh, Crown land, 
and then there's that issue. <laughs> but uh, uh, crown lands are not automatically, in, in fact, far from it, uh, protected lands uh, for the purposes of um, uh, the target. I think that's a simple answer. There's a lot of nuance to that one. The vast majority of crown land is not protected. The vast majority is not. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to add that all of the FSC sites on our map too are on crown lands, but there's other industrial activity still ongoing there. Yeah, and I think it is really important to emphasize that point that the story map does include both what might be called crown land or um, and also or unceded land is another way to put it and uh, and also private land. So we've really tried to make the story map uh, inclusive of both because we need both and we need IPCAs to get to the targets, right? So, I mean, I think the targets are, we can see other jurisdictions like Quebec moving forward and, and getting there, but where Ontario sits right now, we are very far behind and it's going to take all of these places and all hands on deck to actually get to these targets. Um, and maybe that is a good place to end it since it is 8.30. And Larry, I believe you are, and again, yeah, I just wanna remind everyone that this webinar recording will be available. Go to the story map website and you can see a lot of the information there as well. Put up your special places um, and you know, continue the discussion. So Larry, I think you are doing an, or you're you're doing an ending for us. Am I right about that? Certainly. Okay. Um, and just before, and I know it's uh, it's eight thirty. Uh, I'm going to encourage uh, participants, uh, and you can you can find them electronically. Uh, take a look at We Rise Together that was produced by the Indigenous. Okay, I thought I was unmuted. Um, uh, I'm just saying uh, I encourage participants to take a look at We Rise Together, uh, produced by the Indigenous Circle of Experts under Pathways One. Also the National Advisory Panels Canada's uh, Conservation Vision and even the government response, One With Nature. Uh, and there's a few, if anybody wants to, you're welcome to uh, contact me. I've kind of uh, isolated what I call a half hour of reading uh, to get a sense of the core recommendations. Uh, and it, for that matter, uh, well, yeah, I'll just leave it at that right now. Okay. Kwe um, Kwe Kiji Manadu, Chi uh, Miigwech uh, for this uh, uh, rich dialogue. Uh, for the opportunity uh, to share uh, both from uh, a Western science per perspective and also from uh, an, an indigenous perspective. Uh, what's, what's important here is our responsibility to our relatives, uh, to, to all of uh, the life givers, uh, to the water, to the land, uh, and all the life that is hosted there. Uh, and uh, I appreciate um, the good heart, the good minds of not only uh, the speakers uh, this evening, uh, but to all of you who've asked good questions. I, more, I saw more good questions than I could respond to. So uh, I appreciate that we've come together in a good way and uh, that there is much more work to be done, um, but uh, we'll get it done. We've got to do it for future generations. With that, I pour water on the council fire and uh, wish everyone uh, to stay safe and healthy in order that we can continue to celebrate life and work together for the continuance of all of uh, the species that have been created. Miigwech. <laughs>